So my name is Martin Chibrowski, and this is uh, Tommy, my colleague from the CTO office, and uh, I'm not alone. A lot of people from the CTO office joining us today. That's really awesome. I actually know that there's around 60 people online as well. So welcome to you as well. Um, oh, we have the clicker. Let's head it off. We only have 30 minutes, and there's a lot to cover. We might not cover everything, but uh, let's start by just making a brief introduction what this meant by an assessment. So in KMD, there's a lot of product. And if you work, work in a product for a couple of years, you find out that there's lots of things that are not working. And you try to spend all your time fixing stuff that is broke, right? And uh, at one point, you might have the question, why are we still fixing these things? Why is this not working? Maybe we're doing something wrong. It would be nice if somebody from the outside could just have a look and just give us their opinion, right? And that's actually what uh, the CTO Office's uh, 360 is about, is just give an honest opinion about all the aspects there is in product and come up with some ideas that could direct the product in a, an improvement, right? Normally we use this analogy that when you come to the doctor, the doctor can ask you all kinds of questions. That's probably nothing to do with what you're, why you're there. They'll ask like, are you getting enough sleep? What are you eating? Do you have your exercise? Do you smoke? Do you drink? All these uh, things, right? And that's just to get a good idea of what could be the issue. How much coffee do you drink, for example, right? So um, these six areas is some of the questions we could ask a product. Some of it is obviously about quality of code, something about employee experience, something about agile and metrics, the way you work, some financial numbers, profitability, some technology choices, and of course, how do we deploy and release. And uh, today, we're not going to cover all of them. I have to remember this one. We're going to talk about these two. But before we do that, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, because none of you will probably like to be assessed. <laughs> So um, this is actually uh, some of the points that uh, we had last time we visited a product. We had a lot of assumptions of how the product would actually react to having an assessment. The assumption was, of course, that we would find a lot of technical depth, right? Uh, we would also have the assumption that there would be no general test strategy and no test automation. automation. Um, there would also be this mindset of no willingness to change. It's always been like this, so why change? And a bit of hostility toward us in this CTO office, right? Um, and what we find out when you actually go out and meet people, you do the clicking, is uh, there was actually no significant depth. This was actually quite a surprise to everybody. <laughs> Because working in a product that is 20 years old, there must be some kind of depth, and of course there is, but not to the extent that uh, we thought. Um, there is a well-defined test strategy, and they actually did deploy a lot. However, the unit test was, was lacking. Next. Uh, everybody recognized the challenge, and they were actually very eager uh, to share and to do some changes. And lastly, everyone has been very open and friendly to us, right? So I think it's important that when we do assessment, we remind ourselves that people generally don't like uh, assessment or there's some kind of fear attached. So recognizing this up front is always good. But let's dive into the actual assessment. Yeah. Um, so since this is a tech summit, we're um we thought about going into a quality of code, as this is probably the most tech-savvy thing we have. Um, obviously, we also look at the architecture, but uh, for now, let's uh, look at the quality of code and uh, what we mean by quality of code, because code quality is a heavily subjective subject. So uh, we try to take that subject and do it into take it, turn it into something more objective, something measurable. So when we talk about quality of code or code quality, we have a different uh, parameters that we look at. The first one, size, doesn't really have anything to do with quality, so that's a good start. Um, 
but it is a good measure that we can actually use in some of the other uh, parameters that we look at. We look at code churn, which is basically how, much, how many changes are happening to the code base, how often do we have to modify files that we have uh, committed. We look at technical debt ratio, which Martin just briefly mentioned that we didn't really see any significant amount of. We look at test coverage. Um, we look at testability of the code, so how well is the code written to be tested? We look at complexity of the code, so um, how readable is the code? Of course, we dive into which languages are used. That's also basically to, to get an understanding of what competences uh, are needed and required. And we look at the architectures that, that, that basically tells us something about how scalable uh, the solution is. <clears throat> I have to apologize, my voice, I have a bit of a, of a cold, so <laughs> that's why my voice is a bit uh, rash. So the first thing um, we're going to, to look at is the um, test coverage. And, and basically, this probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, but, but we want the majority of the test to be around the lower end of the test pyramid, which is the unit test, which is the tests that are actually closest to the code. So we want small, um, isolated tests that can be uh, triggered uh, rapidly. And the thing about the test, strategy, test pyramid is that the lower you are in the pyramid, the cheaper it is to write the tests and run the tests. And one of the reasons why it's so um, efficient to have tests in the uh, lower end of the pyramid is that the feedback loop <coughs> is shorter, which means that you will um, often have um, a shorter time from from creating the change to actually getting a feedback of whether the test has run and whether it's successful. So, as much as possible, we want the test to exist in this lower case. Um, the first assessment that we did had a lot of unit tests and actually pretty good, uh, no, sorry, a lot of tests and actually pretty good tests, but they were all in a sort of exploratory domain, which means that running the test is expensive and time consuming, and which means that from the developer creates a change to actually seize a um, the result of the change, it takes a long time. So, for the mindset of the developer, you create the change and you have to wait perhaps two weeks, three weeks, four weeks to get feedback from it. Your mindset has, uh, has shifted and you're already thinking about something else and, this, and another problem that you're trying to solve. <clears throat> so, as much of our test as possible, we want in the lowest bracket. Another thing that we're looking at is uh, how much of the code is actually covered by unit tests. And ideally, we say we prefer something around 80%. That's an 80% coverage and an 80% line coverage. So 80% of the lines are covered by test. And that's just a metric that we put. Honestly speaking, it doesn't really matter if it's 70 or 90%. Um, the important part is that you have a positive trend. Um, so we would much rather see a low coverage but a rising trend than a high coverage and a falling trend. Um, one of the reasons being that with a high coverage but a falling trend, it appears that new code is not covered by test, which means that test has not been a, a, a focus point. Um, and that means that all new functionality is, is, is expected to have a lower quality. Um, instead, if you have a rising trend, it means that new code is, um, is expected to have tests covered, and that, that means that test is an essential part of the design of the code. So, we prefer a rising trend over a falling trend, no surprise there, but even over a high coverage, we want to see a rising trend. Um, and the reason why I said that that doesn't really matter whether it's 70 or 80 or 9 percent, it's because once you reach those numbers, you have a sufficiently uh, effective testing strategy. As long as you have a rising trend, it doesn't really matter. There might be customer contracts that require you to reach a certain amount, but, but that's a different topic. <coughs> yeah, just a second. So, we both have uh, something with our voices today, so uh, that's why I'm do some crawling, uh, swimming. I guess back swimming, back strokes. <laughs> and now Tommy is ready. Go. Yeah. So we really enjoyed the Polish weather. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that we can measure, and, and these are all objective measures, that we, we follow a very well-defined um, 
um, protocol for how to, to calculate these uh, scores. So the first thing is the cyclomatic complexity. And cyclomatic complexity really tells you something about how testable the code is. So you look at a piece of code, and you can actually get a metric back that tells you, well, how easy is it to write a unit test for this code? So the cyclomatic complexity tells you how many linear paths are there through this code. And it'll give you, for a function, some value. And we, and this is basically our uh, interpretation, we want you to ideally be in between 1 to 10. It's, it's, it's not possible always to have a 1. I mean, that'll... That'll never happen, but but from time to time you can you can end down that. But but ideally we want you to be in the range of one to ten. That means that your functions are um, well isolated and easily testable. But one thing is testability. That doesn't actually mean that the code is readable. For that we have something called cognitive complexity. And cognitive complexity tells you something about if I as a reader looked at the code, how easily can I understand it? And and understanding is important because we write code, but as products live for, on for 20 years or perhaps even more, it is very likely that someone else will look at our code and make changes to our code. So cognitive complexity tells us a bit about something about how well can I, how easily can I look at someone else's code and read it and understand it. Um, so with uh, cyclomatic complexity, we can focus on unit tests that tends to have a positive effect on the cyclomatic complexity because you are forced to sort of um, reconsider how can you make your code more testable when you have to write tests for them. With cognitive complexity, it helps to have a, 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 an extra set of eyes on it, pair programming, um, thorough unit, uh, uh, um, code review, and etc. With cognitive complexity, we would like to see a number that is at most 15. And again, these are numbers that we have chosen. Um, if they had been 20 and, and uh, 30 here, it wouldn't mean that much, but it just to have a sort of a baseline that we are aiming for. Yeah. So one of the next things that we are looking at is uh, something called technical debt. And basically, whenever you add a line of code, you're adding technical debt to your product. So technical debt is completely... Uh, 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 you can't avoid technical debt at all. So, and since technical debt scales with a line, number of lines of code, we are looking at something called the technical debt ratio instead of the, the actual technical debt. And the technical debt ratio is the amount of technical debt you have, which is measured in time, um, versus the cost of rewriting uh, the solution. <clears throat> is this where I come with a question? So uh, how do you actually, uh, oh, wow, <laughs> you come prepared. Yeah, um, so technical debt is something that we get from a tool called Sonocube. You could use any other tool. Basically, basically it sums up uh, the amount of uh, code smells that you have in your code and adds a, a, a penalty or a cost to that. But the cost of rewriting a product, how costly is that? Well, um, if we're using Sonarcube, it actually says that a single line of code takes 0 0.06 days to write. And that is, with a quick, that's around 16 lines of code per day for an, an eight hour day. And most people will look at that and say, okay, I'm a lot more efficient than uh, 16 or 17 lines of code per day. Um, and then that, that is where you have to stop and say, really? So um, the mythical man month actually uh, states that a uh, seasoned developer will write 10 lines of code per day. There are other studies lying in the around of 20 to 30 lines of code per day. But that is basically what you can expect. And if you go beyond 16, 20, 30 lines of code, you'll probably end up adding more technical data anyway than you're fixing. So we're calculating with 0 0.06 lines of code per day. And it doesn't really matter that much as long as the baseline is the same in the entire way through. So um, for uh, the last um, assessment that we did, um, I've extracted the numbers uh, that we used. So we had 122,600 minutes of technical debt in that project. And that sounds like a lot until you consider that it had 743,957 lines of code times the cost of developing a line of code it ends up being 
something minutes to actually rewrite the code. And in that context, the technical debt ratio is less than a percentage. And for technical debt ratio, we um, prefer or advise that it is below 5%. So this is extremely low. I've, I've actually never seen a number that low before, which came as a surprise to us, but it actually came as a surprise to the product as well. They were shocked, which is, which is actually a fun, uh, fun thing. So the last thing about um, code quality that we're going to look at here is to focus on, well, when you do have to rewrite uh, parts of your product, where do you want to focus? So one th way to look at that is uh, to look at the churn of the code, that is, which parts of the code are changing most often, most frequently. So if we have many changes, we are in the um, right side of the diagram with a lot of churn. And then look at the complexity compared to that. So if we have many changes in areas of the code that has a high complexity, then that is probably the area that we want to focus on rewriting. And that is some of the guidelines that we can, we can assist with. So we can look, where do you have a lot of changes? Where do you have a lot of complexity? Which part of the uh, code base of the product is not testable? So this might be where you want to focus your effort. Yes. Awesome. Uh, next part that we can cover. Well, how much time do we have? Eight minutes, right? All right, okay. So release and deploy, probably the most hard exercise any product will face is actually shipping it to the to the customer. Oh, need the clicker. So this actually came out of uh, as a tangent of the original assessment, but we found out that this obviously needs to be part of the 360 assessment. How do you deploy, right? 14 is actually 14. 14. 13. 13 minutes. All right, perfect. <clears throat> so, um, one way of asking questions about versions is uh, you have this diagram. Uh, so down here you have like versions and on the y-axis you have customers. So if your product looks something like this, you'll have around 12 versions of the product in production, right? And with a total of let's say 50 customers, you will spend a lot of time updating and moving stuff around. So this is an example, but the yellow bars are hot fixes. So for those of you who are actually intimate with releases, normally you would have like one release, and if you had any changes to it, you would hot fix those changes immediately, right? But as you progress, and you add more and more versions into the production, and customer starts testing it, you'll find bugs on old versions, right? And here's the dilemma. Do we fix that version? But what about the versions in front of it? Should they also have that fix? And these new versions probably had new code. So all of a sudden, everything that Tommy talked about tests, like the high-level test, you begin to be extremely dependent on the unit test, right? So this is, uh, this is an area that we, uh, we have a lot of talk about in, uh, in the 360 assessment. And uh, from your own point of view, uh, having one version in production is extremely efficient, uh, but not always uh, easy to get there. So number of version in production is important. All right, so another thing is to understand is uh, it also takes time to deploy production uh, versions to production. Some might think that it takes just with the click of a button and everything is in production. Some areas uh, you need to have like a couple of weeks of preparation just to update uh, the customer to that version. Um, usually uh, you actually ask the customer that you're going to introduce this new functionality and they would like to test it. So they'll test it for a couple of weeks, and if they don't find any errors, you might do an update. After you've done the update, you want to do uh, hypercare if there are any errors, right? In this case, uh, which is not unnormal to see, here you have a product. It has a version coming out every quarter. 
So let me just quickly go through the, the diagram here. So every column here is a month. The number of customer that this product can upgrade is five, right? So, and we spend roughly three months creating one version. So when the team starts building version 33.01, we start upgrading customers, five a month, right? After three months, new versions come out, right? So we start upgrading new customers with the new version. The old version is still there, three months later, and so forth. Which means by design, you always have four to five running versions. So it's not just about reducing the amount of version, it's also understanding how long does it take to actually upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's uh, that's basically it. I mean, yeah. We'll, uh, we might have time for some questions, I guess. Uh, we have like, what, five minutes? Ten minutes. Ten. Ten. <laughs> All right, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I have one question. Uh, you went through two of the six uh, criteria that you mentioned in the beginning. Are you planning to give us an introduction to the remaining ones? Yeah, we can go back to uh, the beginning. Let's see if there is anybody uh, specifically. Here you go. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, well, some of them are metrics that we do not really as the two of us have an opinion about, I mean, we do not dive into employee experience here or profitability. So uh, obviously I'm kind of going to spend time on that, but, but that is part of the 360 assessment. Yeah, I can, I can actually tell. So normally we would actually go to the HR department together with management and pull out like employee engagement surveys. Um, we'll look at development satisfaction, retention rate, um, how is the actual uh, situation with the uh, employees? Are we looking into uh, Polish-Danish setup or Bangalore, Poland, Denmark, right? What is the age? All these uh, things, just to get an idea of like what kind of product are we talking about, right? So that would be one part of it. Uh, another part would be profitability. Would be like how many? Uh, how is the the margins really for this product, right? Uh, um, how is uh, the revenue, how is the EBITDA, uh, how does the customer see the product, uh, do we have a trend, is, it, is the net promoter score rising or falling, right? These are things that you want to consider. And obviously, once you have all these things, you can start to do some correlations, right? For example, customers that have many versions out there, they will probably experience that it takes long to get a specific feature, right? because they need to either upgrade or the entire development organization is busy creating new features or fixing hot fixes, uh, stuff like that. Uh, technology choices, uh, actually we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can mention a few things about that. So um, so we look at the uh, technology choices and the architecture that, that, that have been put into the product and, uh, and see, okay, how close is this to be scalable? So. For instance, um, can we add extra nodes? Can we? Can we? Uh, is it something that we, that is actually capable of being moved into the cloud, uh, or is it locked to some different, uh, some specific vendor? Does it use Azure Functions, for instance, and is being uh, locked to to Azure? Um, is it using a specific uh, database system that is particularly difficult to migrate to to other systems? Is it a microservice architecture, and can we? Therefore, uh, take any of our services and replace with someone, something else, for instance. Um, is it containerized? And um, do we get the benefit of that, not only in deployment-wise, but also when um, reproducing uh, a production-like environment for the uh, developer? Um, and for, for the last uh, assessment we did, we actually spent a lot of time trying to understand how the containerization of the product uh, was. And th that was a journey that was ongoing. Uh, obviously not complete yet, but that was ongoing. So we also look at what is the plan. So uh, this is the technology stack that you have now. What is the future plan for it? And how does it support that? 
Um, are you are you um, considering moving into new markets, and will the technology that you're using uh, still support that? Are the technology you're using uh, based on uh, deprecated uh, frameworks, um, languages that uh, are specifically difficult to to uh, to find talent for? Um, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, um, agile and metrics. I just want to make a quick. Uh, comment on that. So <clears throat> vast majority of development teams today are using some kind of agile methodology. Uh, you'll probably see teams organized in with product owners, scrum master, they'll have a backlog, they all come out of have some kind of sprint. And obviously we can uh, have an opinion about that. Um, often scrum teams will have a, you'll never see scrum team that, that think they're doing awesome. <laughs> They'll always be struggling with something. Uh, if they're really good, you'll find out that what they're struggling with is extremely specific. Uh, that's also a, a very good sign. But in this case, um, a team that is working agile and metric but have a deployment strategy with so many versions of, of, uh, of the product will struggle no matter what, right? So yes, we could try to improve some of the things, but unless the, the product changes its strategy regarding versions, not much is going to change. So you would not get any bang for the buck of the time spent there, right? So that's one example uh, of how you can do the, the 360. And I guess an important uh, note on that is that, yes, we, have, we try to identify the bottlenecks, the real bottlenecks that you want to solve. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think that uh, concludes, unless there is there's one question. Yes. Well, obviously, anybody who's uh, interested in understanding products, either themselves, their own product, or being part of a strate strategy, would probably need to dive into this. I think this is this is something that is happening to some extent on some products across KMD, but this is the first time that we try to like write all the things down, all the questions that we potentially would ask, right, and have like a structured approach to it, and we have like dedicated people like me and Tommy helping a specific product, right? That, so the, uh, these things are hopefully going on in the company, but I think right now from the CTO office, this is one of the things that has like a structured approach. Uh, and we are discussing to what extent this should be uh, uh, shared. Right now, there's a bandwidth uh, problem and it's only me and Tommy doing it right now. Uh, and it takes, it took at least one, uh, one and a half uh, month to just gather all the data and then subsequently you want to identify and analyze the, the the problem and have the dialogue with the the product area. and from there on we can talk about implementing the 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 changes that you're looking for right and if you want to do that across a company like kmd where we have like close to 50 60 different product uh it's going to be a challenge right but Sessions like this could be inspiration for a lot of teams to do something similar. Yeah. Can I just add that that you might actually identify a subset of this that you want to run. So, for instance, you might identify that you only want to focus on the agile metrics because you, that's an area that you know you you have some issues with. So, yeah. All right. That's it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>